Amen. Thank you so much, Mandy and Krista. Um, I can hear myself a lot. I don't know if that's supposed to be. Can I go down? Thank you. Amen. Hey, the place family. Y'all know I'm not a like a teacher, teacher person. So we're just gonna have a conversation again, right? Um, God speaks to me like Sunitra said. God speaks to me funny ways. So I, I knew that I was on the schedule, you know, to teach something this Sunday, and I was like, okay, Lord, you know, what did it? What is it that you want me to teach on? And there was like radio silence. And usually there isn't radio silence. Usually, like I, you know, the Lord starts speaking to me early on in the process. And then, I think about a week ago, he showed me a nail, like a, a nail. I was like, okay, are we going to the cross? Is this Jesus being nailed? And that's exactly not what he was intending. So he gave me the title of today. The message is called Bob the Builder. <laughs> Anyone familiar with Bob the Builder? Good, in good company. I was not until he said that because I didn't grow up here, right? So I looked up Bob the Builder. I'm like, oh, okay, okay, construction. So the scripture that today is um, the foundation scripture is found in Matthew 7. And I'm going to ask if you have a Bible or a phone or anything. Please can you follow along um, with what the word says? Matthew 7, 24 to 27. And it reads, Therefore... Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundations on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. And the rain came, and the streams rose, and the winds blew against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Bryce, if you can put that first slide up for me, please. Um, it's a funny story I want to start off with. So I, like I said, I grew up in South Africa, and when I first came to the U.S., you know, I, I came to the city, to New York, and didn't see construction, but the very first time I saw a house being built in the States, like, my mouth was wide open. I was like, they built with wood? Like, where's the concrete? Like, where's the, like, how can it stand? And for the longest time when I was in people's homes and they didn't even know it, like, I would walk extra careful because I was so scared. Because, I mean, I'm a, I'm, I'm a person of presence. I'm not the smallest person I know. And so I would just walk, and I'm like, I would be so afraid, especially going upstairs that are made of wood. I'm like, oh, man, if the stair, you know, falls and I fall. And, and our stairs in our old house did, in fact, one of the stairs gave way. And at night I would be sleeping, and I'm thinking, you know, what if somebody that built the house, what if you forgot one of the nails? You know, what if someone was having a bad day? Or like how sometimes we are at work and we're there, but we're not productive. And we're looking at the screen, but we're not doing work. What if that day the person that was building the house, you know, he was just like, you know what, today's just not the day. I just don't feel like it. And so, like, I was really, I had a real fear about how houses were built. And I'm not saying it to shame houses in the States because we know because of different um, the b different um, climates, because of how housing started here, because the U.S. was built by migrant people that came and they had wagons and trekked across the land, and so that's how they made houses. And even for me and my culture, I'm Kosa. Can you guys try to say that? Kosa. I'm from the Kosa tribe. And we are no a nomadic people in terms of herds. So we would stay in one place of uh, area, and you know our herds would graze the land, after some time, we'd have to move because they would have eaten all the grass. And so we would take the huts that we make out of slats and mud and, and hay, and then we'd let them go down, and then we'll move and go set them up somewhere else. So I'm not judging. I'm just saying it's different, right? And so I look at this scripture, and it says, Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. It's not just everyone that hears it that does something with it. Everyone hears it, and some choose to do something with it, and some 
choose not to. So it's a very contrasting scripture, right? It's contrast and compare. Is that what they call it like in school? Yeah. So I'm contrasting and comparing the way that people build houses in Europe versus the way we build houses here. And I'm going somewhere. I'm just trying to set the foundation, right? So in Europe, most homes are built with brick and mortar, right? It's like bricks or in Ireland, it's more stone because that's how their culture evolved over time, right? And a house that's built in Europe is built to last, who can guess how many years they build the average home to last or the projection for the average home in Europe is to last? Just wild guesses. 75? 100. 100? 200? Actually, it's 400 to 500 years is the projection for what they build the house to stand for. Now in the US, who wants to take a guess how long they project? No, no. By the, sta by, the by the standards and the codes, an average home is expected to stand with, with proper maintenance between 100 and 150 years. And so contrasting and comparing between the two to build a house that's going to last 100 to 150 years, there are benefits to it, right? The benefits being that it's less expensive to build it, right? Um, it just takes about, on average, three months. Some of us have seen houses go up faster than that, right? Doesn't it sometimes worry you <laughs> how fast they put the houses up nowadays? It gives me pause, like, hmm, 100 years from now, that's 80, 80, so like my children will be in the older age, will the house still stand, you know, if they're getting older? But the homes in Europe are built, and it takes an average of a year. So three months is one season. A year is four seasons. To me, there's a, there's a spiritual picture in there that if you take a short period of time to build something, it'll last a short season. But if you take the time to build it right, it'll last for a longer time. The Word of God says, and if you're taking notes, please take the scriptures down because there's quite a few of them, and they all build and come together. Proverbs 24, verse 3 to 4 says, It takes wisdom to build a house and understanding to set it on a firm foundation. It takes knowledge to furnish its rooms with fine furniture and beautiful draperies. And I know we have people in our midst um, that love decorating. I know Crystal, she's like a, Crystal is that girl, okay? She, she adornment, she's really good. Stephanie is like, like even all this, that was just in Stephanie's mind. Um, Rebecca's very artistic and you can see it in her home. But it takes wisdom to build a house, understanding to set it on a firm foundation, and knowledge to furnish its rooms with fine furniture and beautiful draperies. And isn't our walk with Jesus similar? Isn't it like building a house? I know for me, my salvation is the foundation of the house on which my walk stands. It's the foundation that started it all, as in, hey, this is me. Come walk this journey with me. I got saved um, in my mother's church. Who's ever heard of like a Moravian church? Okay. It's like a, <laughs> like a Lutheran church, kind of, with no hand clapping. It services an hour. And I'm not judging it. I'm just laying the foundation, right? And you have lots of programs. Like we had a youth program. And I was involved because my mother was on the church board. So that meant that I was part of the youth leadership and I had a Sunday that I had to take care of. So that Sunday was my turn and I always got like the non-fun Sunday. People got games and people got food and I got spiritual. <laughs> and I was not happy about that. But anyway, so I did it out of route. You know, you have a scripture that you're supposed to say and then you're supposed to say some sp spiritual things about it. There was nothing. I, there was no, no spirit, no feeling, no nothing. And that evening, like at the end, we were holding each other's hands, and then I clearly remember where we were in the church. And we were standing in a circle praying. 
And when I said, Father God, I heard him answer. I remember where I met him when my foundation started. And for many of us in this walk, it kind of becomes route after a while. Either we grew up in church or we started going to church and this is what we do because in our culture, our culture is built around a weekly cadence of things, right? Work starts on a Monday and it works through and on the weekend and there's sports and then on Sunday, we are a uh, predominantly Christian nation and I don't want to get into that because uh, it can get hairy. <laughs> we are a religious nation, let me put it that way. We are a religious nation because if we were a Christian nation, our resources would look like what we, our confession says, and it doesn't. So I'll leave that there. So that is my foundation. How can, how, do, does anyone remember how they came to know the Lord? Like, do you remember where your foundation with him started? You don't have to say it just by a show of hands. It's good to sometimes go back and refresh yourself, right, and say, okay, this is my house, and I'll get to that. So I said, Lord, if your word says that here, because it did not fall because its foundation was on the rock. So then foundation must be important to him, right? Because, you know, he doesn't, like God doesn't waste words. Even though the Bible is 66 books and there's a lot in there, he doesn't waste words. He doesn't waste concepts of which he wants to, to, to teach us with, and especially Jesus, because Jesus knew he wasn't here for a long time, but he knew he was here for a good time, and he knew he was here for a purposeful time. So in those three years, whatever is written down that he said, I always tell you know, young people when they, like, how do I read the Bible? I said, get to know Jesus first, because you need to know who you serve. You need to know who the king is to who you, which, who you pay homage to, right? And he says that, the, the house didn't fall because the foundation was on the rock. So I said, okay, um, in my nerdy brain, let me find out how home foundations are made in the U.S. In the U.S., the primary material for foundations of homes is concrete. Now, who knows what concrete is made of? Concrete is a composite material made of three main components, water, Cement and aggregate. Aggregate is like sand, you guys were right. Gravel, crushed stone, all of that. And sometimes they use recycled material to make it into this, like they make it fine, and then when you add water back to it, it becomes concrete and the sun makes it hard, right? And um, they make, they reinforce it with steel, um, and it includes typically a foundation, which is the base. And I didn't know any of this stuff, and I always go past homes. So it was fascinating to study for this, okay? So it has a base that, that distributes the weight, but it also has a stem wall, which is vertical. And the stem wall is what supports the house, not the foundation, not the broad, flat part that we see, but the, the, the building part that they build up first. And then the concrete covers that, but the foundation of the house, the thing that supports the weight is the vertical wall. Isn't that a picture of Christ? I'm like, this is so fascinating. The Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. And everything that we see comes from the unseen. And sometimes we forget that it's all based on Christ. Even the, 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 the scripture, our foundation scripture that says, everyone who hears the word of mine, who's heard of affirmations? What are affirmations? Isn't it us just telling us things that we know about ourselves, but we sometimes forget? And doesn't the scripture say, speak to yourself, encourage yourself in the Lord? So even the things that, like the Bible doesn't say everyone who hears these words that is saved will build their house on the rock. Everyone that hears these words and practices them will build their house. And so that's why certain things that we think are secular and they work, the origins come back to the word of God because the principle is that when your voice hears yourself speak, it builds you up on your inside, right? All right, so back to the foundation. Who's heard of the story of the three little pigs? All right. So what do the three little pigs do? Facts. 
Uh huh. And then the first little pig built his house with? And then what happens? And the big bad wolf comes and he? Huffs. And he? Puffs. And he blew the house down. Rain came. Winds blew. My house is built on you. How does the enemy attack us? He huffs. <gasps> Shows us how big and bad he is, right? He huffs. And then he puffs. And then he blows. And oftentimes those blows come, come in the form of words, come in the forms of words that were deposited, like I prayed for our youth, words that were said a long, long, long time ago that we have made ourselves think we've forgotten, but when a certain circumstance comes together and that word puffs up in our life, it hits us and takes us our knees out from under us. You're worthless. You shouldn't have been born. I should have aborted you. You know you're supposed to be here. You walk in power. You have a powerful job. You've built a beautiful family. But when the rain comes and the wind blows and those words rise up and puff itself up at you, they can take the knees of a powerful person from right under them. Packs back. The second pig. What did the second pig do? with sticks, right? So straws and sticks, aren't they friends of the same family? And then what happened? And blew it down. And this time, because, you know, the, with the three piggies were in the same house, right? Or oh, that the first one ran to the second and the two ran to the third. Okay, good. So the first piggy thought that the house of the sticks must be better than the house he built and straw, straw right? Because the, the, the wolf just blew it over like right away. But sometimes even when we reinforce ourselves with things of the same nature that just seem stronger, it's still a fallacy of the enemy. The word of God in Psalm, uh, Psalm 11 verse 3 says, if the foundation is destroyed, what can the righteous do? We have to look at what our foundation consists of and how it's put together. Because if the foundation is not solid, at some point, there's a, a building in um, Los Angeles, and this wasn't part of my study, so I don't have the right reference uh, for you. It's a huge, multi-story building that is sinking. Because after, I think, 45 years... The foundation has slowly been giving way on one side, and so it's tilting like the Tower of Pizza. But the peep, Pisa, sorry, the people that built the house got a loan from some international bank, and they can't demolish the building because those people want their money back. But nobody can move into the building because the building assessors in LA are not going to approve it. So it's been standing empty all these years, and it's leaning. Think about all that investment. Think about all the engineers that worked on it, people that were qualified. Wouldn't you think that somebody would have known? But isn't that also like our world? There's so many people that are experts, but when we look at things, you're like, how can our school system be in this kind of trouble when so many people have PhDs and they work for the administration? How can there be so many homeless and hungry people in Charlotte when there's so many of us that pay thousands of real estate taxes, right? How many of our cars are taxed? How much money is pooled together in our city, but we can't even take care of those that are vulnerable? Talk about our veterans. What is the Pentagon budget in the United States? But we can't take care of those that have gone and put their lives and their bodies on the line for us? It makes one think, what is the foundation? What is it made of? So I was looking at what is it that causes a foundation to get weak? What causes a weak foundation? Any, any thoughts? <coughs> Guesses? Yes. Big one, moisture. Another thing is wet soil, which is a consequence of too much water in the soil, right? So wet soil can be compared to someone, 
and I, I wanted to make it applicable to us, right? Because it's great to talk about a building, but what about this building? Wet soil can be compared to someone that is so spirit-filled that they know earthly good. Amen. And I'm going to talk about myself because I don't want to point fingers, but I'm sure maybe some of us have met someone who is so focused on the not of this world part that they are no good in the in this world part. And so everything is spiritual. You see a hungry person, you have $100 in your wallet, you're going to pray for them and give them a word from the Lord because you are so super spiritual. But I challenge you that if you have $100 in your pocket, the super spiritual thing is that God has given you the resources to make a difference in that person's life and then pray for them. Because we see when Jesus met hungry people, or when he talked about the Samaritan, he didn't say that the good Samaritan prayed for the guy and left. He told us, he, he, he actually structured the story of the good Samaritan and said that he was of means, right? And then he took the man, took him to the inn, and even said, if what I left is not enough, I am coming back around and I will take care of whatever else is needed to make him whole. So that's the wet soil. And we have to be careful as Christians that we don't become so spirit focused that we know earthly good. God put us in the world for a purpose. I always say it. We are the salt and the light. Salt on its own in your McCormick salt thing at home does no good until you sprinkle it over food to give it flavor. And so the reason why he made us the salt and the earth is so that on my job, when everybody's afraid and we're all hearing of more layoffs coming, I need to be able to recognize that I'm in this situation, but I'm not of the situation. How am I the salt in that situation? That is why he put us here. And then you have, on the other hand, dry soil can also cause your foundation to be weak. And what does dry soil look like? It's a little bit like how I explained how my mom's church is in the beginning, right? But in the evangelical movement, in our world where we are, dry soil looks like, you have tattoos? You know the word of God says. It's an abomination. You've had an abortion? You know the word of God says it's an abomination. You're a homosexual? You know the word of God says it's an abomination. The words that I'm speaking to you about who you are are going to find entrance. Does God agree with some things and sin? Does God agree with sin? No. But how did Jesus act when he met sinners? And I always say, for me, my husband will know, even when we're in the midst of things, I'll say, how do I find myself in Scripture, especially in the red-letter words? The way the church has acted towards people that we don't agree with has been very dry soilish. To the extent that we've allowed the enemy to take our own words and drive people that need Christ away from him. Because we've created a place within the church where we don't say, come all who are weary and brokenhearted, and we will give you rest. We've said, you're not welcome here. It is my job to preach the word of God uncompromised, but it's the work of the Holy Spirit to bring conviction on the heart. Because if I come with my word of condemnation and add a weight on another person's shoulders, I don't know if that weight will break them or if it will bring them. I'm not saying that you shouldn't. I'm just saying go find in the word of God how God dealt with things. The only time I see Jesus raise his voice and lash out was in the house 
towards the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Because we, the children of God, the blood-bought children, we are of a different standard. God says, be ye holy as I am holy. He did not tell the world to be holy as he is holy. Our standard is holiness. And for us, it includes lying. It includes bitterness. It includes unforgiveness. Be ye holy as I am holy. But when we deal with the, the world, we have to be the love of Christ that draws them in. And as they come in and see the standard of holiness that I uphold for myself, that I don't beat Rebecca over the back with, then she will look at me and say, you know what? What can I do to be saved in this area of my life? What can I do to be saved in this area? Because as we follow Jesus, we follow him because we've seen him be holy in the earth. And as we become him, they want to become us. Right? Yeah. That's the dry soil. Okay, let me hurry. So, um, like Mark said, moisture is a huge, huge issue with foundations. Um, I don't know which scripture I'm at. I think the, is the cracked foundation with the house the next one? Yes, that's it. Okay, so <laughs> the scripture here is Hebrew 11 verse 6 and says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. And I, had, I, I pulled this picture up because the house looks really pretty, right? And the books represent studying and diligently seeking him. But the, the little magnifying glass is showing under the house that looks pretty. There can be major issues like a cracked foundation. And the studying said that even a very small leak can cause foundation problems over time. And it's hard to gauge leakage, especially a small one, because it doesn't set off any alarms. It's difficult to gauge leakage in my faith because it doesn't set off any alarms. What does that look like? How do I diagnose leakage in my life? How can I know? I would suggest a few ways is my prayer life and my worship. When it starts losing its allure, and I put this here, this is not condemnation or anything like that. We all know it goes through seasons, right? Like some seasons, you are so super saved, listen to me. You are walking on water, you just, the word is coming, everything is a revelation. It's like, oh, I take a shower, look, I'm being bathed in the water, and just, oh, I'm just so saved. And some seasons are really dry. Like some seasons, you're like, God, am I even hearing you? So it's not whether or not it's seasonal, it's whether or not it's persistent, because this word diligently seeks him. Diligent means you do it over and over. You, you do it and it becomes habitual. It becomes the thing that you do all the time. And so when your prayer life and your worship starts going down over time and it's perpetual and persistent, I present you that there's a leak. Someone who in the Bible went through a season of leakage is Aaron. Remember Aaron, and, and it's pray, your life of prayer and worship. Worship is going to tell you a lot about yourself. Worship will give you a light onto yourself because when you come into an atmosphere of worship, when your faith and your spiritual life is at a certain level, you respond to God's word and God's presence in a certain way. Whether you're on your own in the car and it's that song and you know we just, and then the other time it's like so much going on, it's like, oh, let me just change the song. So Aaron walked with Moses. Aaron was the guy that was there when all the plagues were happening. Wait, Aaron was the guy that was there when Moses was stuttering. Yeah. Let's first start there. Aaron was the guy that saw <laughs> Moses and that he had run away. So Aaron knew the whole scope of who Moses was. Here's the same guy walking up to Pharaoh unafraid. Remember, Pharaoh could have killed Moses because Moses killed an Egyptian. So he's going up into the middle of the police precinct knowing he has a murder on him and that he could have just been locked up. 
So Aaron saw all this, and then he sees Moses almost like transform into this like superhero, like, hey, let my people go, and let my people go. And then all these plagues are happening just as Moses has said. So Aaron saw all these things, but um, Moses goes up on the mountain. Instead of worshiping God, the people say, hey, listen, Moses has been gone too long. We've been in this desert. We need something to worship. And Aaron says, okay. And so the allure of pleasing the people takes Aaron from his place of worshiping God to creating an idol to worship. You're never too big to fall. How many men of God, women of God that we've looked at that are powerful, that have done amazing things for God, have we not seen stumble in recent times? Because the small leakage is very hard to detect. But by the time it becomes a problem, it's so hard to fix. The second one is when your words that are coming out of your mouth start to become more complaints than giving thanks. It's an indication of what's going on on the inside. And an example of that are the people of Israel. Because, hey, the people of Israel, I know, man. (laughs) I know, man. (laughs) The people of Israel were in literal slavery for at least two, three generations. Mm -hmm. Right, Rebecca? She's our scholar. I have to make sure I'm right, right? They were in slavery. They were freed without them fighting a war, without them shedding blood. None of them died to get free from slavery. Mm. They were fed while they're being freed from slavery. Not only were they freed, they got the things that the people that enslaved them had, they got their jewelry, they got, they got their stuff, so they were over, like, you know how we say, God, I want an overnight blessing? They became overnight millionaires, whatever it was in that time. They left with the riches of Egypt. They went into the desert with the riches. They still had the bangles. They still had all the stuff. They still were getting food every day. But what did they do? They complained. So when your, when your life, when your words, when your, at, when your attitude starts becoming more complaints, then, then waking up in the morning and say, I woke up in the United States of America this morning. What did you do to be born a U.S. citizen? Like how did you manipulate being part of your family? What did you do before you were born to choose your family? You know? Like how, how did you work so that you are in a nation where you can find a job? where you can go to school, where you can go to a grocery store to get food, where you're not living in war, where people aren't coming into your country to mine the ore that makes iPhones and leaves you destitute. So at five, you have to work in a mine to be able to eat something. What did you do to deserve that? What did you do to deserve that? Nothing. So the very breath in the morning when you wake up should be, God, I thank you for this life that I have, the breath in my lungs and the life that I have. And then you look and you're not outside. What makes you better than someone that has a PhD but is homeless? What makes you smarter than that person? Nothing, right? There are people experiencing homelessness that did everything right. But life happens. And so the fact that I have housing and a roof over my head should make me grateful. I can open the tap and water comes. And so when I perpetually, and I'm not saying seasonal, because things happen in our life and we go through seasons, but when, you're, when your default becomes complaining, there's a leak that you didn't recognize. Lastly, when you become a doubter, real quickly, you can become skeptical of yourself, which I think I'm in that category, right? Like, because like, I'm like, Lord, you chose me to do this. Huh, okay. <laughs> iffy, iffy choice. And there's people that were like me, right? Adam was skeptical because um, God gave him dominion. But then as soon as God made Eve, he was like, well, maybe she knows better because he let her decide, you know, to give him whatever it was. And then he took it, so he abdicated his power. And then you have... Abraham doubted himself, Moses, David, Elijah. Elijah, after doing the huge, big miracle Pastor Ed was talking about, he ran away. He was like, oh, 
I'm done. And it's so funny because Sunita prayed for me this morning, and that's where she was praying that after speaking, I don't run away and go run behind a bush. <laughs> <laughs> There's one thing to be skeptical of yourself, but you can also become skeptical of God. And we know who did that, right? Thomas. Thomas that walked with Jesus all those years that he was here, all the miracles Jesus did. And Jesus even said he was going to die, and he said he was going to wake up. It was rise up from the dead. And when he came, like he was like, I don't, I don't believe it happened. So when your skepticism becomes becoming skeptical and doubtful of God, there's a leak. Skeptical of God's promises over your life. Skeptical of God's word and what God's word says you are, right? And lastly, and this is a big one, and, and this is a big one for me, unforgiveness and bitterness. They are twins. Unforgiveness and bitterness. And, if, and of them making a dwelling in your heart. Because becoming unfor, uh, unforgiving about a situation for a period of time is human, right? Becoming um, um, mad and upset in your heart and be like, I can't believe they did this to me. Like, why? Like, I didn't even do anything. Why did they stop talking to me? I, didn't, I was trying to do something good for them, and this is what they did. But once it becomes a dwelling in your heart, mm. it becomes a problem. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, verse 15, be on guard, speaking about unforgiveness, be on guard against it, because even a little root of bitterness mm. can do so much harm to you and to others. Bitter people in the Bible, Naomi. Naomi's bitterness is because she found herself in a situation that wasn't her fault. Her husband wanted to move when he heard about a famine. There wasn't even a famine yet. He heard there was a famine coming. And he was like, oh, time for us to go. Let's pack up. We're moving out. And he moved her and her children out of the land, and then she lost him and the children. Was she justified to be a little bitter? I would say so. But what Naomi didn't know that all things are working for my good. All things work together for our good, who are called in Christ Jesus, right? Called according to his word. And Naomi didn't know God had a Boaz in the future. Because even though Boaz was Ruth's gift, he was Naomi's blessing. After Ruth met Boaz, married Boaz, became part of the lineage of Jesus, Naomi was taken care of. And yes, it hurt that she had to lose her husband and her children, but God brought restoration. And sometimes the thing we are so bitter about isn't something we can ever change, but God is faithful and he will bring restoration. Losing a child is painful. Losing a home is painful. Losing a job is painful. But God is faithful and he's true and he will bring restoration. King Hezekiah, King Hezekiah found in Isaiah 38, 10 to 17, King Hezekiah had a fatal in illness, and he was bitter about it. When you get a disease or a sickness in your body, and it's nothing that you did, you didn't do anything wrong, but you're living with it in a way that is internal to you because you're facing the consequences every day. It's a weight and a bitterness that can settle in your bones about it. But what King Hezekiah did in his state of bitterness is he prayed and prayed, and he wasn't healed the first, second, third. In fact, the Bible doesn't even say which prayer made him whole, but he prayed, and eventually he was healed. And lastly, this one is a trip. Abram's wife, Sarah, she was called Sarai at the time, right? So she couldn't have a baby, and she was really mad about it, right? Because it meant a lot in the culture to be able to reproduce. There was a lot of weight on a woman's shoulders to be, I want you to understand, I'm not judging her, because I come from a culture where if you're not married at a certain age, every event you go to, everybody, the first question is, when are you getting married? As if you can just go run and grab a husband <laughs> and get married. And so it starts creating bitterness. And I feel like in the church, we do the same thing to people that aren't married sometimes. Or they get married, and the first thing we ask them, when are you having a baby? And they have a baby, and it's like, when are you having another one? It's like, can you leave me alone? 
like seriously. So she said, okay, fine. God put this on me that I can't have kids. How am I going to fix it? She's like, oh, I've got a maidservant, Hagar. Bless you, Michelle. I've got Hagar, and I am Hagar's boss. I'm her master. So I am going to tell, ha- I'm going to tell Abram, because she didn't tell Hagar. Now remember, as a woman, you're being owned by someone to work for them, but then they even own your reproductive rights. She told Abraham to go lay with Hagar and have a baby. And when Hagar had the baby, and when her plan worked, she hated Hagar for having the baby that she told Hagar to have. And she banished Hagar out into the wilderness. And so that kind of bitterness that Sarah had, that is the kind that can bring your whole house down. When you plot and you plan and you do something, and then it works out, but it doesn't work out the way you thought it was going to be. That kind of bitterness can really be destructive. So all of this to say that for today's teaching, I want you to go back to your foundation and make sure that your foundation is strong and the vertical walls are intact and that you do a self-assessment in terms of whether there are leaks or not. Is my soil wet? Is my soil dry? At some point in the future, we'll get to faulty construction and the nail that Jesus sold me um, and why that is important. But I want to end up with Ecclesiastes 12, verse 11, that says, The word of the wise prod us to live well. They are like nails hammered home, holding life together. They are given by God the one shepherd. That's what the message says. The New Living Translation says, the words of the wise are like cattle prods, painful but helpful. Their collective sayings are like nail-studded sticks with which the shepherd drives his sheep. And I always say that Ecclesiastes is the book of rude awakenings, right? Who's read through Ecclesiastes? After you read Ecclesiastes, don't you feel like you need like a spiritual cleansing of the palate because some of it is really doomy and really gloomy but it's also very realistic it's very real life and God put Ecclesiastes after Proverbs and then he says in Ecclesiastes that the words of the wise are like goads and he just spent 31 chapters talking to us about wisdom the importance of wisdom what wisdom means and each one of those scriptures is like a nail and what the the shepherds used to have is like a a flat like how the um omegas have the i don't know what you call paddle was like a paddle but then each of the they had like little spikes in it like little nails and that's what they would use for the sheep that won't listen to the shepherd's rod they'd have to use the goad with the nails to bring them in and keep them safe and so In closing, our faith is the hammer, but God's grace is the nails of his word. Mm -hmm. And if we hear and attune our ears to what God is saying to us through the word that is our foundation scripture, is that we who are wise, let us listen to God's word, but not just listen. The key is that we have to put God's word into practice. What does practice mean? Moya's at practice. She goes every Sunday for two hours and on a Tuesday for an hour and a half. Those of us swimmers, you have practice, right? Do you, is the time you practice equal to the time that you compete? Is it, is it a half of the time that you compete? It's probably not even a, a hundredth of the time that you compete, right? And so you practice and you practice and you practice and you practice and you practice so that when, if you can come up, Mandy, when the wind blows and the rain comes, Mandy, if you don't mind, please, and when the enemy huff and when the enemy puff, you have practiced. You have put God's word inside your heart. You have watched and you've checked your foundation. You've taken out the magnifying glass. Every time you see a sign 
that might be, hey, maybe there's a leak, you allow the Holy Spirit to inspect, you allow the Holy Spirit to assess, and you allow the Holy Spirit to citate. Because if you just let him look at you, but you don't do anything, and if you don't allow him to give you a citation and say, hey, Pearl, this bitterness that you are holding in your heart against your biological mom is going to cause a crack in the foundation that's holding your house. This is what you need to do. You have 30 days to work on it. If you don't allow him to give you those citations through his word, we are going to build skyscrapers that have no foundation. And it may not even be in our lifetime, but when our children live out the foundation that we've set for them, the cracks will cause the house to fall. And so as the worship team sings this song, if there's any area that you would like prayer or prayer support on, if there's something that you've noticed, or even if you, your ears have become so dull that you're not hearing anymore, we are here to pray with you. But this song really tells me the importance of having Christ as a foundation. So you know what the place, if you need prayer, come up. If you don't, just worship.
Amen. Amen. So before I dismiss one last part, if there is anyone here that says, but how do I know, how do I put together this foundation? It goes back to the constitution of cement and the nails that I never got to speak about today, but it's part of the sermon that God showed me. Nails are made of steel. Steel is made of iron ore. Ore comes from the ground. God made us from the ground. Cement is made of, the, the concrete is made of the, the sand components that we talked about, right? That gets um, ground down. It comes from the ground. So he has already made you with what is needed for what he's called you to carry. So the nails have like a PSI. They have a, a, a grading of how much weight they can carry. And the weight of the call that God has on your life. He's already given you the constitution of the materials needed. Right. So